आदरणीय गुरुमूर्ति जी से मैं निवेदन करता हूँ कि विषय को यहाँ पर प्रतिपादित करें आदरणीय गुरुमूर्ति जी I am really nervous when I have to talk in English. The only language in which I can talk without being nervous is Tamil. But that's not the language in which I can share my thoughts today. So I will beg all your pardon to share my thoughts with you in English. The subject given to me is our potential our country is thousands of years old and so the potentials are always there so i have to first try and explain what happened to the potential we are talking about the potentials today unless i explain what happened to those potentials to talk about potentials will have no meaning so i will try and devote some time on what our potentials had always been it is not only the potentials have come into existence day before yesterday they were always there if we survey the indian polity economy it's all in facts and figures if you look back in the past 50 years it is a case of missed opportunities if you look at the data available it is very explicit as to where we have erred our course has been riddled with errors this is what i would like to tell you first in the year 1966 if i remember right or earlier dr radha krishnan who was the president of india he made a speech in parliament he said there is a gross maladministration of the vast resources of india this is what he said if i recollect it was in 1965 or 66 i am not very sure about the date but this was a very famous state statement made by a president in fact the speeches of president are supposed to be drafted vetted and approved by the cabinet this is one speech in which the president deviated from the text approved by the cabinet and he made his own remark and unfortunately the political system was so insensitive unresponsive that remark of dr radha krishnan was dismissed as if it was some kind of a casual remark made but when we survey the indian development in the last 50 years that was a statement made on facts it was a very profound statement not only we were making mistake from 1950 to 1965 when dr radhakrishnan made the statement we continue to make those mistakes for the next 25 years we maladministered the material resources of india about which i will tell you immediately we also mismanaged the mind of india the human resources were mismanaged first we never realized we were in a combative world a world full of fights a world full of disagreement a world full of disharmony this combative world in economics it was competitive in politics it was combative but we lived in a world of our own we always thought of peace we thought wars would never come even though great sages like sun tzu always said war is to attain peace 
peace is to prepare for war they are interchangeable but somehow there has been a historical era in which the indian system the indian establishment the indian intellectuals lived in a world of their own how it all manifested dr abdul kalam has written a book india vision 2020 in which he deals with what we parade as our virtues as the main weaknesses of india civilizational weaknesses he points out five basic weaknesses of india one greater tolerance and less discipline and we pride about our tolerance and this tolerance is not a virtue it's a weakness history has repeatedly taught us this tolerance has never been a great virtue this is the first civilizational weakness second dr abdul kalam says a lack of sense of retaliation we cannot retaliate christ told the christians if somebody slaps you on one cheek you must show the other cheek but the christian civilization never did it nobody in our civilization no god no literature said if somebody slaps you in one cheek you must turn the other cheek but we always did it we didn't have a sense of retaliation this is the second point kalam makes the third is more flexibility in accepting outsiders atithi devo bhava anyone coming from outside we immediately become reverential towards them whether it is another religion or another king or a total stranger and less flexibility in accepting our own people it's a consequence greater adherence to hierarchy preferring personal safety over adventure these are the civilizational weaknesses india has to reckon with and even now it has to reckon with you may have all the resources you may have all the potentialities unless we also understand we means i am not talking about the 100 crore people of india the 100 crore people of india look up to a million people it is they who set the agenda it is they who think for the rest they act for the rest they lead the rest and my presumption is all of us belong to that category we are part of that million which is supposed to think act and work for the entire country this million will have to think of what abdul kalam reminded us this historical civilizational weaknesses which we have inherited unless we properly deal with them we will not be able to exploit our potentialities about which i am going to talk to you a little later then we are not even aware of the damage that colonialism did to us colonialism disrupted our social order it disrupted our mind our education system whether it is formal or informal does not even bring out these issues many of us were not aware or not are not aware even today that in the year 1820 1820 mark just 180 years back india had a share of 19% in world production 19% when the share of britain was 9% and the share of america was 2% 19 nine 2 and we didn't produce everything and consume our share in the world trade was 18% and that of britain 8% and that of america 1% this was when britain was halfway through the industrial revolution 
we were producing by hand and they had begun producing by machine and our literacy rate was 33% at that time and in bengal alone we had 100000 schools in villages 100000 schools in villages in bengal alone and the literacy rate in england which was the ruler at that time was 18% and what happened in 1947 our share of world production became 1.7% our share of world trade 1% literacy rate down to 17% from 33 but we are all told and we believe and we keep saying that is britisher who developed us he made us into one country and he educated us he gave us enlightenment the mind of india was corrupted the 900 years of islamic rule could not damage the country in the manner in which the 150 years of british rule could damage it it made us disbelieve ourselves lose confidence in ourselves lose faith in ourselves as a nation we became defunct this was the impact of colonialism why i want to emphasize on this is there is a colonial continuation the language in which i am talking today is a colonial continuation the continuation is so effective so deep rooted that anyone who is a who has mastered this language english language who speaks in this language who writes in this language is regarded as an intellectual he is regarded as more capable this is the colonial continuation about which i will deal with a little later then what happened in the post independence period the greatest handicap of the post independence period was the dissipation of national spirit which was generated during the freedom movement during the freedom movement there was a revulsion against foreigners and things foreign the assertion of indian nationalism and on 15th august 1947 the aversion or opposition or dissent to things foreign and foreigners completely evaporated from india in fact a very major industrial group i don't want to name that group they used to wear only dhoti till 14th august 1947 on 15th august 1947 as a family they decided to wear full suit saying we are no more slaves so we can wear the dress we want so this shows the mind i told you about how there was a continuation of the colonial mentality that continuation is in the english educated india this english educated indian is a very important asset of india he is an indian he is the one who can communicate with the rest of the world he is the one who can argue for india with the rest of the world but unfortunately he is the one who argues for the world against india he is partly divorced from india this asset in the post independence period became virtually a kind of a liability the nationalists in india did not know how to handle this how to handle the english educated indian and unless you handle him you cannot handle the world and we said we don't want english nationalists said this but how to handle it so this complexity of the situation resulted in the english educated indian being alienated from the whole setup and abdul abdul kalam says three important implications of this one the blind adoption of whatever was foreign two admiration for things made 
or ideas coming from outside three very little faith in our own abilities this became the character of the english educated indian which was shared by the rest because everybody looked up to this leadership he was in the position of leadership he was the civil servant he was the banker he was the lawyer he was the engineer he was the chartered accountant he was everything and so the intellectual leadership he was the press he was the writer he was the journalist since the intellectual leadership was in the hands of the english educated indian the weaknesses of the english educated indian began percolating down to the people and it in the far last 30 40 50 years it has reached the last man completely perverting and subverting and reversing the pre independence mindset there is no doubt the english educated indian controls the indian establishment whether we like it or not by shutting our eyes to that we are not solving the problem we are not dealing with the problem we are not taking it up as a challenge and no nationalist force handled this issue this had a very deep impact on politics and economics policy making dealing with the wto about which bhagwati pragash ji mentioned in the morning that we are not even arguing our case well because there is a gulf between those who speak spoke for india and india the result there are two important instances as to what is the kind of loss of faith of this group in india there was a german calendar on the world map accurate and the picture was so accurate an indian sets a brilliant calendar and the picture is so accurate he showed it to abdul kalam abdul kalam told him and he also said indians can't produce this kind of thing abdul kalam said the picture that has been taken for this calendar has been taken by the indian remote sensing satellite and the indian is oh interesting so the english educated mind cannot accept an indian achievement about which four more examples abdul kalam gives later all this is necessary for us to understand why our policy makers are failing why those who are in position the writers the intellectuals why are they not understanding india they are not understanding precisely for this reason they have no faith in india they have formed a club india can't do club that india can't do this this club has to be attacked another instance which abdul kalam relates one person said india was always defeated because we didn't have modern weaponry india did not do military research then kalam told him you know the rocket manufactured by tipu sultan was the one which was improved upon in 1805 by one william congreve a british defense engineer and this was approved by prime minister pitt and it was used in 1806 in the war against napoleon and when he said this the indian intellectual the indian writer the indian journalist did not believe then abdul kalam had to procure the book written by a british scientist where this fact was mentioned and kalam goes on to relate when we produce the satellite and launched it india was the only country which could launch the satellite in the second attempt russia succeeded in the 11th attempt america succeeded in the fifth attempt we succeeded in the second attempt when we launched the satellite an american journal wrote that indians have not done it abdul kalam happened to be in in nasa for two months at that time he stole the secret americans could write it indian journalists picked up that news item and began saying that india pirated this technology from america abdul kalam says 12000 engineers 
scientists worked on this project for years together and it is not this 12000 engineers and scientists for years together who produced the satellite but abdul kalam stole the technology in his stay in two months in nasa indians wrote the english papers wrote deriding india whatever little confidence india would get out of launching the satellite and joining the satellite club of five countries one journalist could destroy it then we launch in the prithvi again the same thing this technology was rerouted by some spy device from germany then agni was launched the same thing it was something taken from nasa then pokhran blast explosion is it no it was not a hydrogen bomb at all this is the only blast nuclear blast which was recorded in 250 seismic stations all over the world no other blast has been recorded it must have been so intense so powerful a blast which is recorded in 250 places he can't believe we can do it it is this class that india can't do club which is in position today they are the judges they are the lawyers they are the financial consultant they are the bankers they are the civil servant and partly they are the politicians so when we talk of your your potentialities this is the problem and unless this problem is encountered whatever is your potentiality that potentiality will not manifest and the consequences proliferation of the india can do clubs in the press in the administration and in the public domain and it is added to this is the infusion of socialism in our midst the socialist philosophy destroyed our respect for businessmen destroyed our respect for traders an army can only handle the problem on the battlefield and in the business field only businessmen can handle but we thought ias officers can handle this with the result we completely delegitimized our business people we delegitimized our professionals delegitimized our traders called them middlemen called them thieves nationalized the wholesale trade and completely crippled the trading and manufacturing talent of india in the from 17th century if you look at the records till about the early part of this century india dominated the trade south of the middle east go anywhere it is in fact singapore hong kong penang rangoon was all in the hands of indians it is our sindhis our marwadis our punjabi our chettiar who were having this entire cities in their hands but the chinese were nowhere in the picture but our government destroyed these people because their entire trading talent was based on their resources in india connections in india we cut them off with the result the entire trading enterprise of india in africa in uh, in singapore in hong kong in penang in rambu it all collapsed today we want the trading talent back where will we get from them they have all become clerks in banks this is how socialism mesmerized india and completely destroyed the trading and manufacturing talent of the enterprise of india the best talent in india which came out of colleges and schools became ias officer they became bank officials they would not set up business everybody began applying for job who will give jobs if everybody puts application this is how for 40 years we crippled the economy added to this was the overnight defection from socialism to capitalism in 1991 if we adopted socialism without any thought there was a thoughtless transmission from socialism to capitalism this is the backlog we carry when we are going to talk about our potentialities and our potentials remain buried under the burden of these disadvantages what are our potentialities first thing in the last 10 years i have been very intensely associated in debates with the business people the policy makers writers on economic affairs 
And one thing I found in the last 10 years, when we began talking about Sudeshi, economic nationalism, this country standing on its own, indigenous research, when we began talking about it in 1992, we were all dismissed as lunatics, that it is just something impossible. These people are living in 15th century, 16th century. This is how we were dismissed in the year 1992, 93, 94. But in the last three years, I find just as these people defected from socialism to capitalism, they are defecting from globalization to Sudeshi now. You can find in any industrial bodies deliberations, professional bodies deliberations, even in amongst the officials in the, in, in the field of finance or in the field of administration, you find there is a gradual appreciation that India has to generate internalized economic strength. It has to come upon its own effort. It can co-opt the world. It can co-opt other countries by way of some kind of a supplement. But India will have to be built by Indians. This thought is being shared. This is a very important potential. Very important potential. The best minds in India are beginning to recognize that only through Indian efforts India can come up. This is the first. Second, some of you may be surprised that in the World Development Report, report 1999, the World Bank says almost precisely the same which the Swadeshi Jagaran Manch and the entire Sangha Parivar has been saying. They say, localization reads Swadeshi. Localization means Swadeshi. Localization is as important as globalization. This is the first point. Second point, if globalization is enforced in the way it is being done, nationalist pressures will develop and undermine globalization. Second point. And as the evidence of it, they cite the Enron agitation launched by us. They said because globalization was being pushed through in India without proper debate and understanding, the nationalist pressures revolted against it and saw to it the Enron contract was cancelled and the cost of Enron was brought down with the result Enron is incurring a daily loss of $25,000 because of the agitation launched by the nationalists. So in future policy making, the World Bank should not insist on globalization overriding localization. Localization and globalization will have to coexist. This is a very major victory for people like us who have been working in the last 7-8 years to emphasize that mindless globalization will destroy the national economies and this message has been delivered at the global level today. This is the second potential for India. And it is the Indian situation which has been dealt with. And the last important point in the World Bank report is the trickle down theory that allows some 500 people to become rich. And that will make some 5000 people get money. And that will make some 5 million people get money. And that will make some 550 crore people get some food. This kind of trickle down theory, this is not acceptable. World Bank should not promote this kind of concept. This is going to be a disaster for the world. This is precisely what we have been saying. So, our thought through our programs has found echo everywhere in the world. As a result, even a muddle-headed organizations like the World Bank has come to terms with this thinking. Once they put it in writing, they cannot easily go back upon it. This is the second thing. Any policy maker going from India, if he has to negotiate in the WTO, he can show the World Bank document today. If we are asked to open this sector, you say, mindless globalization will destroy. Your own document says this. This is the kind of impact that our work in the last few years has generated. Then let us come to what is the potential of India at the ground level. Vast and endless human resources. 
but we have been made to think that the human resource is a liability why we are told look at the employment exchanges there are 5 crore people av uh, awaiting employment educated people so in india more number of people is a liability and not an asset this is again because of the english educated mind i will tell you the contrast con the contrast the talent in india is empirical empirical means the traditional talent those who have acquired knowledge by actually working a carpenter or a mason or a blacksmith or a goldsmith take anybody these are not people who have passed through regular academic courses they have not gone to colleges and school but they have learned they have mastered it and you know the kind of mastery they have if you look at the foreign exchange transactions of india the annual income brought by these people the carpenters masons nurses all these people including goldsmiths of india who make jewelry and export out of india is 15 billion dollars the entire indian industry tata birla uh, dalmia uh, ambani all of them put together they do not bring even 50% of this foreign exchange 15 billion dollars is the remittance by this group the traditional talent of india and if you take from 1990 dollars the entire indian industry tata birla uh, dalmia uh, ambani all of them put together they do not bring even 50% of this foreign exchange 15 billion dollars is the remittance by this group the traditional talent of india and if you take from 1991 to 1999 the amount of foreign exchange brought by the traditional talent of india actual remittance it will exceed 100 billion dollars the amount of money which we borrowed from world bank imf in 1990 to tide over the crisis is just 3 billion dollars and imf and world bank are portrayers portrayed as people who saved india but the carpenters the masons the goldsmiths they are nowhere in the picture only in the year 1993 if i remember right manmohan singh mentioned passingly about the great work done by the traditional talent of india having said this i must tell you what is this traditional talent the united nations university asked the japanese institute of development studies to give them a report united nations university asked the japanese institute of development studies to give them a report as to how japan became an exporter of technology from being an importer of technology 25 years back they furnished a report of 20 volumes and 11 of which are translated into english and the first volume i happened to lay hands upon and the most important part of the report was when japan began reconstructing its development after the war they relied on empirical knowledge they relied on their carpenters they relied on their masons they relied on their blacksmiths and they never asked for a certificate let us assume i always give this example one of my sons is very good in english and i put him in iit and he becomes an automobile engineer and another is wishy washy in studies and is a school dropout i put him in an automobile workshop after 15 years my second son who has handled the automobile engineering technology which is second only to aeronautic engineering technology in its acuteness minuteness next to only to the kind of technology which flies automobile engineering technology is a very acute technology and after 15 years my second son is as capable or perhaps more capable than the automobile engineer produced through iit but will the english educated indian the system the universities even we will be accept this the entire eastern tradition is learning by doing you ask an indian carpenter to teach how to make this chair or table on the blackboard he will say i don't know you please come i will make it you see it this learning by doing has been the education process of the east collecting everybody in one classroom and putting everything on the blackboard is the western method of education but we believe in that method of education 
with the result of learning by doing as a method of education exists by which a technology survives by which billions of dollars come into india but it is not legitimate it is not recognized everybody says see the human resources development index of india is our rajkumar bhatia carrying two book which will say india is 135th in human resources development it is in gutter india is a useless country you know why our carpenters our masons our goldsmith our blacksmith our ayurvedic physician our unani physician our siddha physician they are all ranked as illiterate in that the people who bring in this billions of dollars you look at their passport in their passport it will be written unskilled workers they are more skilled than many engineers the human resources of india are undervalued if there is a method of certifying giving a formal recognition and legitimacy to this kind of talent the human resources development index of india will not be 135 it will be somewhere in the first 20 or 30 in the world but we cannot even think of it colonialization of mind continues unless we revolutionize our thinking in germany it exists in japan it exists in malaysia it has been brought into being in germany a factory supervisor can look at a factory worker and tell that this man is competent for this work and so he should be given a diploma he will be given why can't we do it in india we have hundreds of universities in india which can testify whether somebody can do carpentry somebody can do masonry somebody can do uh, goldsmithy we can do that we can't even think of it everybody will have to pass through the class everybody will have to look at the blackboard that is what is education so the human resources development index of india is grossly undervalued imagine you may ask me what is the human resources development index let us assume all this is done in the next 5 years and the human resources development index of india travels from 135 to 35 foreign investors will be queuing up to invest in india because foreigners nobody invests his personal money everybody has put their money in some in some bank or in some investment trust or in some mutual fund the mutual fund employ chartered accountant lawyers statistician equity experts they look at these statistics which country is top in uh, 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 law and order which country is top in um, uh, in in ju ju judicial discipline which is top in uh, uh, human resources development index then they begin investing and if all our statistics is suppressed if the national talent is brought down by our wrong assessment of the country how will this country come on value this is where a fresh thinking is needed the next let us go to the natural resources of india in india we have 180 million hectares of land cultivable land 180 million hectares china is two times the size of india china has only 90 million hectares they have exhausted their agricultural possibilities the last hectare of land has been exhausted by china america which is two and a half times the size of india it has 160 million hectares of land cultivable land india has 180 million hectares we are cultivating about 120 million we are irrigating just 34 million hectares the entire agricultural production increase from 50 million tons to 200 million tons has taken place in just 25% of the indian land why 25 million hectares of indian land not 25 percent they say if punjab haryana western uttar pradesh tamil nadu and andhra if they are properly cultivated this can feed the entire asia and the world is looking to countries like india for food india can increase double its agricultural production in 10 years it is a, it is a scientifically ascertained fact but there is no respect for agriculture 
when we met the agriculturist they said only one thing sir our boys are not getting girls it is not respectable to be an agriculturist in this country so people who own 2 3 acres of land prefer to be pions in mmtc and scc in delhi again the english educated mind we cannot respect people because they are doing agriculture countrymen this is how britisher used to abuse our agriculture we don't use that word but the same sentiments continue a yeah, mental change is needed if capable people are to do agriculture agriculture has to be made a respectable occupation and we have sunshine round the year in europe you have sunshine for 4 to 6 months in america in some places 3 months to 4 months only in china only 6 months in russia 2 months without sunshine you cannot grow anything they can grow only one crop in some countries they can grow only one crop china can grow only one and a half crop in some areas two crops in some area only one crop so there are 90 million hectares is only in our term 60 million hectares we are a country in which 180 million hectares can have three crops and our water resources are enormous and you just give water people know how to become prosperous you take a travel through the country wherever there is water there is prosperity all the problems of illiteracy hunger malnutrition law and order you take any problem this can be related to places which have no water just manage the water resources of india then the indian economy will progress but we can't even think of it now in maharashtra of all states in the last 7 8 years there have been a, an assiduous attempt to harvest water and you can see in dry land farming by 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 water uh, accumulation and water harvesting in the next 10 years maharashtra is supposed to surge ahead in agriculture it's possible elsewhere these are great potential and look at india what it has done we had 35 crore population in 1950 55 crore in 1967 we were importing food we have 100 crore population today we are surplus in food grains by 10 million tons a year today and our uh, and our buffer stock is about 30 million tons we can take care of hunger and malnutrition and sudden famine in any other country but still we have india can do club who will never allow india to acquire confidence then look at material resources this is where as a country we fail our material resources are vast but we did not develop technology if we have material resources and not technology it has no value take for instance titanium it's a very good example india has 37% of the world titanium resources it's a very very intricate kind of mineral which is used for all except aeronautic purposes it is used for all other purposes and for 30 years many committees were constituted reports were generated for making titanium into sponge it is a kind of a ore which has to be made into a usable rod kind of form nobody even looked at it nobody looked at it 10 years before one mm sharma dr mm sharma the man has cried before abdul kalam he has written it in this book he said tremendous the biological base of india this is something about which we all should know if you look at the plant varieties in india we have 85000 plant varieties if you look at the cereal varieties in india we have 35000 varieties you know what is the variety available in europe there are just 2000 plant varieties and just 200 cereal varieties because diversity is available only in tropical countries in temperate countries diversity is not there that is why you see people of the same color there and we have diverse color we have 85000 colors in india we have 85000 plant varieties in india we have 35000 cereal varieties in india because god has endowed the tropical country with variety and this is going to be the future victory 
This is the area of Mecca. And that is where they want to come. You know the number of musical tunes which is available only in Rajasthan? They say the Rajasthan musical tune alone will be more than 100,000. Each one is patentable. The musical tunes of all the tribals are patentable. We don't know about this. The resources of India are so vast. It requires an Ashwadani like Brahma to understand what to do with this country. I am rushing to discuss it. Let us look at and about technical, technological competence of India. Apart from the fact in strategic technology, we are virtually on par with the best in the world. Whether it is missile, whether it is atomic, whether it is satellite, take any field, we are on par with the best in the world so far as the strategic technology is concerned. In commercial technology, we are on a breakthrough in many fields. In fact, there is a book which has been published in Innovative India. It's one of the brilliant publications that have been done in the history of the economy by the name Yalan Sharma, L.K. Sharma. He was the, the Times of India correspondent in London. He has put together all the facts. The best people have written. Most of the data which they have written before you are collected from that. There are at least 30 technologies in India where we are almost on par with the world about which is except to the experts, others even do not even know we have that kind of technology. And the most important part of our technological work is, take for instance the our satellite establishment. The annual budget of the Indian satellite establishment is 400 million dollars. If you take the annual budget of any satellite establishment of any country, it is minimum 30 times this amount. Our research is cost effective. And this, in fact, L.K. Sharma writes, this 400 million dollars is the amount which the Americans spend for keeping a museum of all the satellites which they have made in the past. Just to the library. And our CSIR laboratories, which are 40 in number, which rank on par with some of the best in the world, our whole entire budget is 120 million dollars. The entire R&D budget of India, many people say India is spending less. No, India is spending less and getting better results. 1.5 billion dollars, which is less than the amount Pfizer spends for its R&D. Things get, get better results because we have better brains. And if you spend a little more, you will get ten times more results. Apart from this, the talented and wealthy Indians abroad. India is one of the very few civilizations whose ethnic talent outside India is very vast. And they are in different fields. In America, there are 29,000 doctors from India. And each one of them is a millionaire or multi-millionaire. In fact, one of the doctors came to me and said, if India takes only one million dollars from each of us, India will have 29 billion dollars. Imagine financial country. I had been to California. The biggest estate owner there is a Sardarji from India. And the first dinner Clinton had in California, he was in his house. Very influential people. You go to Manchester, the entire in, uh, the British textile industry has been taken over by other Punjabi. The Punjabi. You will not see the difference between Jalandhar and Manchester. But we have no civilization link with them. You see the way Mathura is maintained, Kashi is maintained. You see the way other cities are maintained, they are. You just maintain these places properly, they will have respect for this country. You think economics is just market mechanism. It is a cultural mechanism. It is a civilizational extension. It's a relationship of people bound together by history. This is what uh, Israel has shown. This is what China is showing. We can't think of it. Then unused capacities of India enterprise. I am rushing to because there is no time. Take for instance the Indian Railway. 
Indian railways are at least 17,000 miles of railway line lay. In which one train goes in the morning, another train comes in the evening. I know at least two places like that, between Madras and Kajibar. One train will go in the morning, another train will go in the evening. There is a road by the side. Thousand buses go this side, thousand buses come that way. The cost of running a railway is one third of the cost of running road transport. From Dilipuram to Pondicherry, the same position. Thousands of buses go. We can only privatize the subordinate railway. Seventy-five percent pressure on road transport will come down. The passenger traffic, you know the railways used to be the biggest carrier of passengers. Now bus transport has become the biggest carrier of passengers. And so much addition to fuel consumption. And it is estimated that the stores which are lying outside the organized stores and railways, if it is valued, it may cross 100,000 crores because railways is a nearly 200 year old enterprise in India. It is on the British days. Maladministration of our resources. India is supposed to be increasing its literacy rate so much. By 2020, we are supposed to reach a literacy rate of 80%. And the result of this literacy rise is mind boggling in terms of the talented workforce that will be available, the quality improvement in the performance of the Indian economy, the market size. Enormous. The most important thing is that uh, there is some answer to the WD, the federal character of the Indian constitution. We have the central government, we have the state government, we have the municipalities and panchayats under the constitution. All these three are autonomous, sovereign in their own. I will give you just an example as to how we may have to meet the WTO using it as some kind of a potential. One of the leading automobile groups had called me for a consultation because they came to know only in March 1998. Though the government of India had given this undertaking to the WTO in 1995 itself, that the import duty on passenger vehicles would be 40% from 2004. At that rate, no company in India can produce cars or passenger vehicles. Not only Mahindra or Tata, even the foreign companies which, have, which are producing cars here, they cannot produce cars and sell at that rate. Korea has fixed 85%. India has fixed 40%. Some joint secretary in India signed the WTO undertaking. The Indian industry was not even consulted. So they asked me how to face this challenge. I told them the best thing is, you persuade the state government to levy 50 to 80 percent sales tax on imported cars. Import duty cannot be levied by the central government. But the state governments have not signed the WTO undertaking. They can levy any amount of sales tax. And import, du import uh, sales tax on uh, uh, imported cars can be levied selectively under the constitution because it is a class by itself. This is how we may have to use our municipal mechanism, our state mechanism to counter the WTO, this is also one of the strategic points. The most important point is which I have already touched. The respect for businessmen and traders is a very important aspect if the country has to achieve economic growth. If wars are to be waged by soldiers, business wars will have to be waged only by businessmen. We must come out of this mindset, businessmen are rascals. We have to deal with them. They are the ones who can deliver economic growth. And an organization like the ABVP, in fact all Parivar organizations, all nationalist organizations, will have to work out a strategy in different fields as to how to deal with the situation. And particularly ABVP will have to deal with the aspect as to how Universities, research institutions, IITs can relate to business. And it will be a mutually beneficial kind of arrangement. And in this, I think ABVT can take a lead. That's all I have to say. Thank you.
ফুল্ল কুসুমিতা দ্রুম দল শোভিনী সুহাসিনী সুমধুর ভাষিণী সুখদাম বরদাম মাতরম বন্দে মাতরম কোটি কোটি কণ্ঠ কল কল নিনাদ করালে কোটি কোটি ভুজ ধৃত খর করে অবলা কেন মায় তো বলে বহু বল ধারিণী নমামি তারিণী রিপুদল বারিণী মাতরম মাতরম তুমি বেদ্যা তুমি ধর্ম তুমি হৃদি তুমি মর্ম তি প্রাণ শরীরে বাহুতে তুমি মা শক্তি হৃদয়ে তুমি মা ভক্তি তোমার প্রতিমা গড়ি মন্দিরে মন্দিরে বন্দে মাতরম তম হি দুর্গা দশ প্রহরণ ধারিণী কমল কমল দল বিহারিণী বাণী বিদ্যা দায়িনী নমামি নমামি কমলা অমলা অতুলা সুজলাম সুফলা মাতরম মাতরম বন্দে মাতরম বন্দে মাতরম ভারত মাতা কি ভারত মাতা কি